It's not the weapon that brings honor, but the courage with which it is wielded. How to become a gladiator. The dishonored learn to live and die with honor. Many gladiators disliked the spectators, but still risked and often lost their lives to entertain them. Learn what it was like for gladiators to take their first steps into the arena and become skilled fighters through intense training. We start somewhere in the story, let's say around 180 AD. Emperor Marcus Aurelius has passed away, and his son and heir, Commodus, is well known for being crazy about gladiators. The good thing about becoming a gladiator is that you're no longer alone in a harsh, uncaring world. Not only are there now people who care whether you live or die, no, it's incredibly important to many, and they often bet large sums of money on either outcome. By definition, a gladiator is an outcast, an outsider whom Roman society has excluded for one reason or another. For those locked out of the benefits of Roman culture, life can be hard. While some are lured into a gladiator career by the glamour of the arena, most are driven by desperation and the lack of any other options. Broadly speaking, a gladiator is someone who has taken up the job after trying several other paths, possibly as a bandit, beggar, cattle rustler, or failed gambler. Once the authorities get involved, a swift change in career towards becoming a gladiator might be the chance of your life, or at least the only chance you have left. While slavery in the mines or crucifixion are possible punishments for criminals, a judge may align justice with the munerarius plans and what staff he needs for execution. A judge who sends a criminal to the arena often chooses damnatio ad bestias, where the organizer has procured some large predators and wants to show how they tear the condemned to bloody shreds. Unfortunately, the criminal has missed his chance to become a gladiator. The situation is different with the damnatio ad ludos, where you are condemned to the games, not directly to death, and with energy, ambition, and a fair bit of luck, things might turn out quite favorably. Incidentally, some free men sell themselves because they run out of money. When a debtor's valuables are sold to cover their debts, one of those valuables is naturally the debtor's own person. So, isn't it better to sell yourself well, rather than wait until someone else does it for you, throwing in a dose of violence as a bonus? However, not every recruit steps into the shoes of Spartacus as a victim of circumstance. Those who volunteer to become gladiators are called octorati because they are the authors, octores, of their own misfortune. Anyone who fights for money, especially after signing up with a gladiator school, is infamis, or officially declared scum. An infamis can neither vote, hold office, nor purchase a decent plot for his grave. There is no going back, ever, and that's exactly why some rebellious sons often regret doing it just to shock their parents or an ex-lover. If you have the ability to choose which school you prefer, you're almost certainly a free man at this point. But don't fool yourself. Anyone who comes to a gladiator school, a ludus, sells themselves body and soul to that school. The key conditions you should aim for during negotiations are 4,000 sesterces and four or five years. The money is a legal minimum value assigned to your corpse if you die in the arena. And 2,000 of it is usually paid up front to the octoratus when he signs. Without this valuation, a recruit could end up as a gregarious, one of the gladiators who fight in mass battles until one group is wiped out. Once sworn in, a gladiator becomes the property of the school's master, the lanista, who can do whatever he pleases with him. The number of years matters because anyone who survives the term is usually released from their contract.
Think long and hard before accepting a place in the Ludus. Acceptance means swearing the infamous gladiator oath. Even gladiators condemned to death in the arena swear this oath. For them, the oath is a form of redemption, allowing them to exchange a dishonorable death as a criminal for an honorable death by the sword. All newcomers declare before witnesses that they surrender their bodies to their new master, to be burned, whipped, beaten, or killed by the sword, as their owner commands. Once sworn, you are officially a member of the Ludus, one of the Tyronis, or beginners. You're still at the bottom, but you're now officially a gladiator. Congratulations are clearly not in order. Life in the Ludus In many ways, the Ludus is like a big family, but anyone expecting brothers in arms to be for life and death should brace themselves for some deadly sibling rivalry. And if the Ludus is a family, then its undisputed patriarch, godfather, and absolute master is the Lanista. Outside the Ludus, the Lanista is so despised that even priests who pay many actors try to avoid contamination by negotiating with him through a middleman. But no matter how powerless he may seem to outsiders, and many respectable cemeteries won't even accept his ashes. Inside the gladiator school, the Lanista is the Lord as far as his eye can see. He sets the training program and has a keen eye on the budget. He can fine, whip, or even execute anyone under his control. He is the last person any gladiator in training would want to offend, or else he will literally be the last. Life in the school is shaped by the Lanista's leadership style. The extreme harshness of the conditions in their ludus was what drove Spartacus and his comrades to their famous breakout to freedom. Some Lanistas believe that the best results come from turning gladiators into wild beasts. But the better kind focus on building team spirit and instilling pride in the gladiators, both in themselves and in their profession. By the nature of their job, gladiators in Eludus are temporary workers. Most relationships with the permanent staff are short-lived, mainly because most gladiators have short lives. Still. For a new gladiator aiming to leave the school alive, it's essential to get along with the permanent staff. From their perspective, one of the most important members of the staff is the medicus. Even the smallest gladiator school usually has a medical professional on standby, or at least books one in advance. While real fights are relatively rare, training injuries are common. Additionally, gladiators are just as susceptible to illness as the rest of the population. The medicus is the one who decides how much loving care an injured gladiator receives and provides a form of primitive physiotherapy to ensure that scar tissue doesn't impair mobility. The medicus shouldn't be confused with the doctor. The doctor is called the wise one because he deals with everything except academic matters. His task is to pass on his talent for causing damage to his students. He's the expert in armor, weaponry, and tactics in the specialty that his students has been assigned to. The doctor acts as a personal trainer, and depending on the size of the school, he either works alone or closely with the magister, a more specialized trainer who keeps an eye on the general fitness and nutrition of the students. Besides those who work directly with the gladiators, there are others who are essential to life in the Ludus, but rarely interact with the gladiators. Among them are the scribes, who balance the costs of food, training and equipment against the payments for the gladiators' performances. Everyone has a price, as they say, and these accountants know their worth down to the last sisters. The cook is also an important figure. Unfortunately, the motto of the gladiator kitchen is quantity over quality. Gladiators in training consume astonishing amounts of food. Much of it is burned off or turned into muscle 
because there's no other training program as ambitious as the one they face. Some of the food is turned into fat, which isn't a bad thing. Not only does fat protect vital nerves and blood vessels, but it also bleeds impressively when cut without weakening the overall performance much. This way, an injured fighter can impress the crowd with the heroism of continuing to fight, even though he's bleeding like a wounded pig. Few fights last longer than half an hour. Some can even be over in less than a minute, so carrying around the extra weight isn't a handicap. The Romans don't believe that being overweight is particularly unhealthy. After all, gladiators' life expectancy is threatened by far more dangerous risks. Despite the huge amounts of meat left over from the morning animal hunts, a gladiator's diet is mostly vegetarian. This is because animal hunts, like gladiator fights, are relatively rare events, while gladiators must eat and train all year long. One of the main staples of the diet is barley, a not-so-subtle hint at the status of the gladiators, since outside the ludus, this grain is mostly used as animal feed. Barley is nutritious, but its side effects include strong bowel movements and gas, which give the gladiator quarters a somewhat spicy atmosphere during a winter night. The trainers are fully aware of the importance of a healthy diet for their students, and while they may not know what vitamins are, they do know that their gladiators won't perform well without them. So expect plenty of vegetables on the menu, as fresh as possible. There's also bone ash and charcoal. Ash, oh yes, a carbohydrate-rich diet with a high plant content offers little calcium and the ludus likes fighters with strong bones. So the training gladiators are fed a special mixture that boosts their calcium levels to heights that future archaeologists would call exorbitant. In a world where many people die of cold, malnutrition and lack of basic medical care, the gladiator has a warm, safe place to sleep, medical care fit for an emperor, and as much food as he can eat. Sure, he has to sell his body and soul, but some think it's worth it. There's a reason why gladiators are the first choice for Rome's bodyguards, debt collectors and enforcers. The reason is simple. Nobody, and I mean nobody, can fight like a gladiator. The explanation lies in the training which is long, hard and relentless. When a newcomer arrives at the school, they are assessed by experienced examiners. It's crucial to make a good impression. Weaklings, whether physical or of character, have no place in a gladiator school. At worst, someone deemed useless will be placed in the arena against a promising gladiator. This is intended as training for the talented one, to get him used to fighting to the death and teach him to defeat his first opponent. Phase two involves a wooden post rammed into the ground, which a gladiator strikes hour after hour. He wears a helmet and a sword, both heavier than the standard models. And while his sword is made of wood, it's carefully filled with lead, making it twice as heavy as a regular weapon. Considering that gladiators live by the sword and die by the sword, it's perhaps strange how strictly limited access to real sharp weapons is. Swords are kept under lock and key, not only because the authorities remember what happened when Spartacus and his boys got their hands on real weapons. Gladiators aren't known for being the most balanced people. Considering the fights and intimidation in the barracks, it's unimaginable what would happen if sharp objects were involved. The second phase of gladiator training includes lessons in the most important attacks and defences every gladiator needs. The knowledge and smooth execution of these combat techniques must become second nature. Raw strength is a highly valued trait. The average gladiator is many times stronger than a typical Roman simply because he does nothing but build muscle day after day, hour after hour, while a typical Roman 
earns his living. This puts joints and tendons under massive strain, which will lead to numerous health problems later in life. A risk the gladiator gladly takes if it means trading it for the chance of actually having a later life. Role assignment after basic training. Once basic training is complete, the magister and the lanista must determine the role for which their recruit is best suited. They might even ask the person whose future depends on their decision, but don't count on it. In some schools, the newcomer is destined for a particular role from the start. For example, a particularly skilled gladiator veteran who fights in the Thracian style might be wearing down many of his Samnite opponents. So, a supply of Samnite recruits must always be on hand. In a school with a better reputation, the newcomer might be tested in fights against members of the various combat styles before being assigned to a particular doctor to become an expert in one specific form of killing. It's at this point you could say that a gladiator's career truly begins. Let's consider an example from the ranks of the heavily armed. A guy with a lot of physical strength but relatively limited mobility will likely end up with the heavies. This is a general term for several types of gladiators who are properly called scutari or shield bearers. They are gladiators who fight with a sword, a large shield and a considerable amount of armor. Among these heavyweights is the provocator, the challenger, with his short sword and rectangular shield. He mostly fights against others of his own kind. A provocator fights with around 30 pounds of equipment, including a greave and a breastplate, not to mention the heavy helmet that encloses his entire head. For a fighter in top shape, it's not so much the weight that's the problem, but the fact that the helmet, armor, and shield significantly limit both his mobility and field of vision. Above all, a provocator quickly develops a love-hate relationship with his helmet. It offers excellent protection, making his head almost invulnerable to most attacks. But it comes at a cost. Its anonymity can help intimidate an opponent, but it also makes it easier for the opponent to kill him without remorse. As every provocator knows, five seconds after putting on the helmet, an itch develops on the bridge of the nose that no amount of scratching can relieve. Additionally, even a seasoned gladiator will get out of breath quickly in a provocator's helmet because his trained body requires more oxygen than the air holes provide. On top of that, he can't see his own feet and he doesn't see much of the arena either. That's why the provocator is trained to never take his eyes off his opponent, no matter what. Given all these factors, the helmet is the last thing the provocator puts on before going into battle, and the first thing he takes off. The shield of the provocator. The shield is more than just body protection for the provocator. A shield is advertising space. It's where a gladiator showcases a distinct personality. Features like three-layered oiled oak with all the top and bottom edge reinforcements are the technical standard in any good ludus. However, what keeps the provocator up at night is the design and color scheme of the front. Unfortunately, a shield is also heavy, and because of the way it's held, by the grip as if it were a suitcase, it becomes a burden after a few minutes, even for a strong gladiator bicep. If there's no immediate crisis, it's wise to lean the bottom edge of the shield against the shin guard on the left leg. You can even advance in this position by sliding your left leg forward across the ground so that the opponent sees mostly the relentlessly advancing shield, behind which a glimpse of the gladiator occasionally appears. When it's finally time to attack, if you're lucky, you'll have about 45 centimeters of sword in your hand. 45 centimeters may not sound like much, but if the gladiator chooses the right target, he only needs a quarter of that to sink it into an opponent.
If you have a well-sharpened weapon, it only takes a surprisingly gentle push to insert a blade into most body parts. Don't try a strong shove, though, because blades that get stuck in bone are difficult to remove. Dr. Galen once said that the best school for a surgeon is the battlefield. However, a gladiator school comes a close second. Only in these places can doctors closely observe how human anatomy truly works, and that's while it's still functioning, at least for the moment. A thoughtful gladiator knows the exact length of his sword and understands that there are very few vital organs in the body that a properly introduced blade of more than 10 centimeters cannot reach. And even the short sword of a provocator is more than twice that length. Note, even if an opponent covers his weak points, a series of small injuries will weaken him over time. So, slash and cut him as often as you can. Overall, a trained gladiator tends to view the human body as insignificant flesh surrounding a number of key weaknesses. Surprisingly, this can be good news for non-gladiators. Rome is a tough place. Many who meet a gladiator outside of the arena do so when they're convinced of the need to pay their debts at any cost or when they discover that the gladiator's employer is extremely unhappy with them for some reason. Anyone beaten to the point of being more dead than alive can find some comfort in knowing that this is being done by professionals who know exactly where and how hard to hit and when to stop. If they do kill someone, at least it wasn't by accident. What happens outside the arena? Gladiators have the biggest impact on Roman life through their performances at spectacles and festivities, but these shows are fairly rare. Many people find other uses for these prime specimens of manhood when they aren't fighting or training. This includes the army. There is a close connection between soldiers and gladiators. After all, both are essentially trained to kill, and military spectators particularly appreciate the nuances of gladiatorial combat. Occasionally, usually during times of crisis, gladiators are even given the chance to play soldier rather than just provide bloody entertainment in the camp. But being a soldier involves more than just fighting. For example, gladiators are used to being served by the staff in their ludus, and procuring and cooking provisions is something of a mystery to them as they prefer their meals ready and served at regular times. Individualistic by nature, gladiators are difficult to maneuver. They are neither trained nor inclined to follow orders, and they fight against each other much better than they fight in formation. Since the chaotic civil war of 60-61 AD, gladiators have been restricted to bodyguard duties for commanders and to arena combat, where they remained for a long time, thanks to the peace that blessed the daily life of the empire in the following century. Even those who stay in Rome find that many wealthy senators and knights appreciate the practicality of having one or two gladiators on their estates. It's not just about evicting unwanted suitors with extreme force. Gladiators also serve as personal bodyguards to senators. Skilled use of weapons still holds value, much like personal fitness trainers today. Some emperors continued the tradition of having gladiators guard the homes of the rich. Nero's favorite gladiator was Spiculus, who managed to collect part of the estate when Nero had his real or imagined enemies executed. When Rome grew tired of the tyrannical emperor, Nero turned to Spiculus, asking him to end his life. However, Spiculus had already fled the imperial court, but he was captured by the mob who crushed him under a statue of Nero that they toppled. In the bedroom, the heroes of the arena also prove their worth, whether people like it or not. Gladiators are, after all, attractive. Many wealthy women who hire gladiators as bodyguards for the night do so expecting their bodies to be closely guarded. 
If a gladiator is rented out for sex and the price is right, he is expected to gather his strength and get to work. In his love guide, the poet Ovid warns against starting an affair right before a major show at the games, presumably because a potential lover pales in comparison to the fears of the arena. Women in the Gladiator Arena Women in the role of gladiators fall into one of two categories, hardened professionals and imitative fighters. But the truth is that female gladiators are rare and hard to find among the ranks of professional gladiators. Still, they do exist, and when they appear, they are a guaranteed crowd magnet at any game. Female fighters go against the nature of what Romans imagine a woman to be, and that's exactly the essence of a spectacle, showing people something bizarre, something radically different from their daily routine. Make no mistake, female gladiators can swing a sword as well as anyone. This is no theatrical act like fighting dwarves or the mock gladiators who mess around while the set is being changed. No, when women appear in the role of gladiators during the games, it's in the mid to late afternoon block, the time when the real fighters take the stage. One of the main problems that female gladiators face is simply that not every ludus will want to take them in. After all, Lanistas, the ones responsible for training and selling gladiators, are still Roman men and not entirely immune to the prevailing opinion that women fighting in the arena is a violation of nature and decency. There are also practical difficulties, like how to get the all-male club of a ludus to accept a contingent of women, not to mention the mental shift this would require for the gladiators themselves. Aside from the fact that sexual tensions in the company would likely rise to another level, can you imagine the impact on morale if a female gladiator were to end up being better than the men? Prelude to the Duel It's a common misconception that gladiator fights in Rome take place during the official games, those public festivals mostly paid for by the state. The true Roman games are about sports and artistic performances. Most festivals include a few days of chariot racing, which can be just as hair-raising and deadly for the participants. But gladiator fights are typically not part of the program. From the state's point of view, they are private affairs, whether organized by a dutiful son in memory of his father, the common excuse during the Republic, or by a generous leader as a gift to the people of Rome. The emperor was jealous of his privilege to host gladiator games on a grand scale. Nevertheless, opportunities for a gladiator to stay battle-ready aren't hard to find. The emperor might decide to add gladiator games at the start or end of an official festival, usually under the pretext that Roman arms have once again won a victory somewhere along the empire's vast borders. The exception to the rule that festivals are gladiator-free is the Saturnalia, that strange midwinter celebration marked by drinking, public revelry, peace, love, gifts and gladiators killing each other, because it's the one time of year when gladiators are almost certain to fight. Most of them look forward to this time of joy with somewhat mixed feelings. Outside of Rome, the priests of the imperial cult are among the main employers of gladiators. They are expected to host games in the name of the emperor and make them as lavish as possible, since meager games reflect poorly on both the host and the emperor's opinion. Once the decision is made to host gladiator games, the high-ranking organizers naturally don't negotiate directly with disreputable individuals like the Lanista. Instead, middlemen walk the path between the senator's houses and the gladiator school. Long before the players are announced to the public, it's decided how many pairs will be set up to fight and how many of these gladiators are expected to die. This is important because the gladiators are just one aspect of the games. 
From the organizer's perspective, the games also revolve around the hunting of wild and exotic creatures and the sadistic executions of criminals. For the provision of musicians, dancers, acrobats, gifts for the people, there's also the matter of a 20% imperial tax in the case of gladiators. The Lanista must also pay a portion of his fee to Esther. Additionally, the Lanista is required to pay a share of the fee to his gladiators. Even a slave should receive around 20% of his rental price. It's crucial to manage expectations about what kind of games will be offered to the public. Spectators are likely to embrace a well-orchestrated event if they approach it with modest expectations. Therefore, games today are divided into four categories. One, relatively cheap mass productions. These are good enough for a small to mid-sized provincial town where the spoiled citizens of Rome wouldn't bother investing their time. Modest affairs cost up to 60,000 sesterces, enhanced entertainment up to 100,000, lavish spectacles up to 150,000, and ruinous spectacles 200,000 sesterces or more. For context, 15,000 sesterces is roughly what an unskilled labourer earns in a lifetime. And since we're talking numbers, the philosophers would say that no one can put a price on a human life or predict how long it will last. A lanista would likely politely disagree. That's because organisers pay the lanista per gladiator killed in combat. The prices were set by imperial decree in AD 177. A first-class gladiator killed in a premier event cost the organizers 15,000 sesterces, while a lower-class gladiator killed in a minor spectacle costs only 3,000. Note that these figures are maximum prices. If organizers manage to have the gladiators killed for less, they are free to haggle with the lanista. Once the numbers are agreed upon, the money is deposited with a banker because gladiators live by the motto, if you break it, you pay for it. Most game organizers try to limit expenses by ensuring the best doctors are on hand to help the injured. Moreover, a host might insist that the fight be stopped at the first sign of injury. For the gladiators in question, such concern for their well-being is encouraging no matter the motive. Ticket prices vary depending on the host's motivations. Candidates for public office want to show off their generosity and will likely subsidize the ticket price heavily, if not waive it entirely. Emperors are especially prone to such generosity as they want to keep enjoying their position for life. Essential to that is the support of the public. Just because an emperor or aspiring magistrate distributes free tickets to the games, though, doesn't mean that everyone gets in for free. In almost every city, especially in Rome, there are far more people than seats in the arena. So, it quickly becomes common practice to trade tickets for cash or favours. No matter why the hosts organise the games, they want a full house. So they hire publicity specialists to spread the word. Posters, known as libelli, are printed to describe the scope of the event. Sign painters are also hired to paint the program on the most visible walls, announcing in detail who is expected to do what to whom. Meanwhile, preparations for the big event are underway. The gladiators are its stars, but they are only a small part of a community that lives by and for the games. For every gladiator, there are dozens of animal trainers, seamstresses, ticket sellers, carpenters, stagehands, jugglers, acrobats, costumers, musicians, bookies, and unskilled laborers. Most of these people live for the arena and view gladiators as short-lived, here today and gone tomorrow. They've seen dozens, if not hundreds, of gladiators come and go. They are the ones who prepare their armour and their ceremonial glorious entrance, and who may later carry their bodies out of the arena, strip off the armour and wash them for burial. So it's best to get to know them in advance.
Participating in the games as a gladiator for the first time is confusing and terrifying enough. What looks like a smooth, well-coordinated show to the spectators can seem entirely different to the participants, especially after the ceremonial entrance. Such an event turns the game organizers into adrenaline junkies, perhaps the enormous awnings meant to shield the spectators from the sun and heat are so complex that they need to be operated by a dedicated crew from the fleet at Mycenaeum. Safety Risks in the Arena Beneath the arena floor lies a labyrinth of storage rooms, corridors and cages where the human and animal victims of the day's entertainment are kept. It's possible that one of the tiger cages might not open when the lifts bring it to the surface. Or, and this would be the greater catastrophe, a cage might open prematurely while still underground. The potential for disaster is so great that the organizers are sickeningly certain that something will go wrong. They just don't know what it is, when it will happen, or how bad it will be. Sometimes when spectators see a confused gladiator standing in the arena after being rushed into the sunlight, it may be because the previous act was cancelled. Now the poor guy, who was expecting a quiet half hour to collect himself before the fight, has been dragged away from his leisurely time on the latrine, hastily strapped into his armour, had a helmet slammed onto his head and then told he'll be fighting for his life in two minutes. On game days, it's best to expect the unexpected. Death in the Colosseum The night before the games begin, something unusual happens. Since the games come from a semi-religious ceremony, all those marked for sacrifice can at least expect a good meal. The customs vary depending on the region, but these meals are meant to be shared by all who might lose their lives the next morning. So, the gladiators take their place at the dining benches, together with other fighters and condemned criminals. You might even find a Christian there occasionally, taking the opportunity to ask what everyone has planned for the afterlife. It's not a good idea to just eat the meal without thinking. Even for those so inclined, remember that the meal is a gift from the man organizing the games. He wants to show that he can be generous to the point of extravagance. So expect that the food at the Sina Libera, the free evening meal, will be much richer than what your body is used to. Your food of choice should be wheat-based foods because they release energy slowly and will benefit you even the next afternoon. Meat is fine, but only in moderation. Others won't bother with such thoughts. It's free, it's good food, and it might be the last meal I ever get. Time to eat. These simple souls will likely end the evening flirting with every female they can find, and probably manage one last round of mindless sex before falling into a deep sleep. Jealous gladiators who would love to kill them for their tastelessness can take comfort. They'll get their chance soon enough. The day of the games begins with the pompa. It's a procession in and around the arena, so solemn and grand that it left later generations with the word pomp. For those putting on the show, it's an organizational nightmare. For the gladiator, it's a wonderful opportunity to advertise himself but also a chance to gauge the mood of the crowd and observe the arena's layout. The gathering area near the capital is packed with nervous participants. Acrobats tug at their costumes. A scantily clad dancer chases a dwarf who just poked her in an unusually delicate area with his wooden sword, and the air is filled with an atmosphere of tension, stress, and barely contained adrenaline. A roar from the amphitheatre announces that the Emperor is now on his way to his box. With opening sacrifices, rituals and a trumpet blast, the pompa begins. The procession winds its way across the Forum under the Arch of Titus and toward the Colosseum, 
The path is lined with people who couldn't get a seat in the amphitheater. The gladiators are near the back of the procession, behind the musicians, the images of Roman gods with their priests and the animals. But all of this builds anticipation for the crowd, and their cheers swell into a storm as the gladiators pass by. The gladiators puff out their chests, strut like roosters, pose shamelessly, and blow kisses to the virgins, or at least make hand gestures that signal a very keen interest. But no matter how loud the crowd may be, nothing can prepare a novice for the wall of sheer noise that hits him when he enters the arena. About 50,000 spectators, mostly dressed in white, swing their togas in excitement and cheer. You know the water organ is playing because you can see the musicians working, but every sound is drowned out by the crowd's roar. Along with the rest of the procession, the gladiators stand to salute the emperor's box and the images of the gods as they march around the arena. Take a look at the slaves carrying the palanquins, displaying the victory palms and silver prizes. And don't forget the Porta Libitinensis, the gate of death. Most of the gladiators in this procession will either receive a prize or take a tour through that gate before the games are over. Now, the procession returns to the semi-darkness of the tunnels, where it dissolves into some confusion. The gladiators leave and return to their rudies to relax, do a few light sparring sessions and exercises, and maybe have a light lunch. They face a demanding afternoon while the wild animals do their thing. Because they have tickets, the audience eagerly leaves after the last of the beasts has shown its teeth, knowing no one will steal their seats. Roman-style lunch is something that can take a while. Done right, it includes a little nap. And for those men who found the dances between acts inspiring, maybe a quick flirtation with a slave girl. As the seats empty, the pace of events in the arena also slows down, though the entertainment continues somewhere. Around the time a young gladiator considers whether he could handle a light salad, the freshly smoothed sand of the arena hosts athletic displays, clown fights, or musical numbers. Sometimes a spectator hoping for such light entertainment may find the organizers using the break to clear the list of criminals marked for execution. As the audience gradually returns to their seats, there's a hum of anticipation. Heated debates over the merits of one gladiator or another break out in the growing crowd. Even the emperor in his box might let his dignity slip and chat with spectators about the odds in an upcoming fight. Now imagine you're standing in the sandals of Virus, a newly minted, heavily armed gladiator of the Mamillo type, facing your first fight in the emperor's amphitheater. This afternoon, your opponent is a Thracian named Priscus. Priscus is a veteran, born a slave and condemned to the arena for his violent outbursts. Today, he's particularly angry because he sees it as an insult to be matched against a novice, you. But as unequal as the fight seems, it isn't. Priscus is making his comeback from a serious injury, and although he won his last fight... Along with the three before that, the muscles in his shoulder have only just healed. His trainers want to send him into an easy fight, and they've decided that you will be it. So early in the afternoon you find yourself in Rome's great imperial ludus, doing some light exercises with the doctor, who's wearing Thracian gear and carefully guiding you through a rehearsal of Priscus's favourite techniques. Now the amphitheatre has gone quiet, and you know that the referees have arrived. For a young gladiator, warmed up and ready to fight, the wait for your match can be difficult. It's probably around this time that you are handed the sharp weapon with which you'll fight. Everyone steps out of range as you go through some practice attacks. The weapon feels very familiar. That's no surprise, as the man who prepared your blunt practice weapon obviously modelled it on the real one. Outside in the amphitheatre, the excited screams of the crowd indicate how the opening fight is going. The audience shouts, 
Harbor, he's taken a hit. And you know one of the fighters has been wounded. How severe it is becomes clear when the referees briefly pause the fight. Then the crowd roars louder and louder as they try to sway the Emperor's decision on whether the defeated gladiator should live or die. Then, silence. The Emperor shows his turned thumb. What matters here isn't whether the thumb is up or down, but what the gesture means. A downward thumb plus a violent stabbing motion can mean that the thumb represents the sword that will pierce the unlucky loser. But a thumbs up could mean the same thing if it's part of the same gesture the Emperor would use if he were personally slitting the throat of the defeated gladiator. A born performer, the Emperor drags out the suspense and slowly makes his decision clear to the wounded gladiator standing before him, stoically ignoring the blood pulsing from a deep wound beneath his ribs. As soon as the Emperor's decision becomes obvious, the crowd's roar takes on a new note, one of anticipation. You don't need to see the Emperor to know that he's decided on death, because you can hear it in the crowd's reaction. Breathless silence falls as the wounded gladiator kneels. He sways slightly, and his opponent, now his executioner, supports him with one hand. His victim grasps the thighs of the man in front of him and slowly bends his neck forward. The executioner raises his sword high, and because this is, after all, a spectacle, he holds it there for the crowd to see. Then, accompanied by a new roar from the spectators, he drives it down. It's a clean practice death stroke. The victorious gladiator stands, soaking in the applause of the crowd. His face is still hidden under his helmet, but small movements of his neck suggest he's watching the attendants pushing through the crowd. They carry silver bowls and collect tips from those who particularly enjoyed the gladiator's performance. The sight carries intended symbolism. The victor claims the spoils, standing in the afternoon sunlight, and the sword raised high. While the spectators clap and cheer, the loser lies dead and unnoticed, almost forgotten by the crowd, even before the shadows of the gate of death have swallowed his body. Almost sheepishly, an attendant now taps you on the arm, and adrenaline surges through your body. You're up. Veterans say the first time they faced real steel is a moment they'll remember for the rest of their lives. Then again, as the older veterans point out, that might not be a particularly impressive feat of memory. One thing is certain, if everything feels blurry as you stand before the crowd for the first time, and even your salute to the Emperor is only a vague memory, once the real fight begins, everything takes on a sharp clarity. A small part of you is aware of the crowd, but your entire focus is now on Priscus. Priscus strides forward with confidence, clearly intent on ending this swiftly. Maybe his shield arm isn't yet up to a long battle. Move toward him, but edge slightly to his shield side. Your own shield is slightly forward, with your sword hidden behind it. Now you rush in, crashing shield against shield, forcing him to strain his weak shoulder. A firm forward thrust and he jumps back. So, follow up with another shield attack to crush his shoulder again. He retreats, steps in a curve, and you turn with him, only realizing too late that he's maneuvering so the sun is in your eyes. Momentarily blinded, you rush forward, remembering that Priscus likes to trip his opponent, and you take the risk of not protecting your neck by ramming your shield down hard. There's a satisfying crack as your shield edge hits his shin, a perfect counter. Then you separate, both panting heavily. Priscus limps a little, but to your surprise, you feel blood running down your own ribs. You can't even remember when you took the hit. The fight continues, and by now it's clear to everyone that you're not at a disadvantage. You press the attack, and now it's Priscus who is retreating. Every thrust is either blocked or dodged, every attack parried. Still, he backs away because you're keeping the pressure on him. Then suddenly he strikes back, 
and you feel a weakness in your right shoulder. Your arm barely obeys you. Desperately, you slam your shield against his again. You hear a painful cry as something cracks and Priscus drops his shield. But you have to do the same and skillfully switch hands to continue fighting left-handed. You're badly wounded and losing blood, but Priscus is also in bad shape. His chest heaves, and it's clear he's in great pain. You're both entering new territory here, as gladiators rarely fight sword against sword, let alone left-handed against right-handed. Exhaustion makes his attacks clumsy, and you land a blow on his helmet. Dazed, Priscus falls. You want to step forward to follow up, but your knees give out, and you fall to the sand. You realize that blood loss is slowly making you lose consciousness. You have no choice but to stretch out a finger and ask the referees to end the fight. You see Priscus blurred and suddenly notice that his finger is also raised in submission. Then everything goes dark. I let the poet Martial describe what happened next. As Priscus fought on, so too did Verus, and for a long time the fight remained even. The crowd repeatedly shouted, both should be released, but Caesar followed his own law, and that law said to continue fighting with the shield until a finger was raised. They stayed even until the end, and evenly they both surrendered. Caesar gave both the wooden sword and the palm, a reward for their bravery and skill. The fight has apparently impressed him. Death and other retirement activities A seriously wounded gladiator isn't usually put out of his misery like an injured animal. An exception might be made for someone who's beyond saving and already sentenced to death by the sword. So it's not the worst outcome for a gladiator to wake up after a fight in the scenarium, the infirmary. First, he now has access to the best medical care in the empire to help with his recovery. Second, it's clear they didn't finish him off while he was unconscious, which means the gladiator, at least technically, has a chance to recover. Third, it means he either won his round or fought well enough that the crowd voted for him to survive. For all these reasons, there's a justified sense of satisfaction. He's beaten the odds. As a rough rule of thumb, the chances for a gladiator to survive a fight are about five to one in his favor. Since an average gladiator fights two to three times a year, he could be dead after two years of his contract. Paradoxically, however, the longer a gladiator has been fighting, the higher his chances of survival become. Roughly half of all rookies don't live to see the end of their first year. A walk through a gladiator cemetery doesn't tell the whole story because it's the higher class of gladiators who live long enough and make enough money to afford a tombstone or who have relatives to erect one. Most gladiators die sooner or later in the sand. There are two ways to avoid this fate. The easier way is anything but simple. Simply fight through to the end of the contract and receive the rudies the wooden sword that declares to the world that a gladiator has fulfilled his contract and is free to leave the arena. Or this is in Fortuna's hands. A gladiator might sustain an injury that renders him unfit to fight again, but isn't fatal. This is exactly why most gladiators wear armor that protects them against anything but a mortal wound. Occasionally you'll find the case of a gladiator who, for instance, is seriously injured in the shoulder of his sword arm. If he's still relatively new, but has saved enough tip money from the crowd, perhaps even as a reward from the emperor for a good fight, he might be able to buy his way out of the contract. A gladiator released from the ludus must readjust in many ways. A veteran might take time to stop thinking of himself, as part of the group. As brutal and spartan as life in the Ludus is, it has its advantages. An active gladiator never has to worry about where his next meal is coming from, who's heating his room, or who's buying his clothes. Former or not, he remains an infamis, a person of low status, and will remain so for the rest of his life. The stain of infamia, meaning shame or disgrace in Latin, 
restricts many of his civil rights, though he still enjoys the legal protections of a private citizen. He can represent himself in business or court, but acting on behalf of others is frowned upon in the first case and strictly forbidden in the second. Going into politics is entirely out of the question. Beyond legal restrictions, an ex-gladiator's career choices are limited to roles that make use of his highly specialized skills. One opportunity is to become a bodyguard. There's nothing better during tense business meetings than having an experienced killer at your side to ensure the other party keeps their cool. So, gladiators, whether retired or on a break, are prime candidates for this role. On the other hand, a ludus might want to keep its veteran gladiators in the family, as they serve as both an example and an inspiration to younger fighters. Not only do they prove that one can survive a gladiator contract, but they might also be persuaded to pass on a few tips on how others can do the same. Whether he takes a position in the ludus depends on his relationship with the lanista. In fact, there's nothing stopping a gladiator from becoming a lanista himself, although such individuals, if possible, are treated with even more contempt than gladiators. Oddly enough, not all ex-gladiators want nothing to do with the arena. Sometimes the draw of gladiatorial combat is as strong for the fighters as it is for the crowd. Someone who was once a crowd favourite can find it difficult to fade into obscurity. There's also the fact that gladiators aren't particularly good with money. Even those who have sworn to never touch a sword again sometimes find themselves deciding between dying poor or killing one more man and dying rich. If a gladiator has saved his winnings and wisely invested his tips after each fight, he might have a nice nest egg to invest in a business. This helps considering that trade in Rome can be a tough business, where violence and intimidation certainly have their place. The right kind of business partner might overlook a lack of business savvy or contacts if the gladiator brings both capital and the ability to handle the rough stuff into the partnership. In later years, perhaps no one remembers how the owner of a thriving tavern on the slopes of the Calian Hill came by the wooden sword hanging above his door. No one will understand why the old man smiles wistfully and touches the old wound that crippled his arm. Only he remembers what it was like to walk the sand of the arena and fight for his life as a gladiator in Rome. <laughs>